uh, is have a second day. It's a wee bit slow too. Quite slow. Oh, you go to the wine glass. Do you want to go to the wine glass? Okay. There you go. So, okay. So we we'll do that exercise in a little while. So you can start with one. Thank you. So let me give you a background. In relationship therapy history, there are several models that have predominated. Some of you may know some of these models. The first to come to New Zealand was something called Imago. And the Marga was also related to attachment history, to the way people attach to their caregivers and childhood. <clears throat> so let me start to talk a bit about attachment. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that most people don't understand. Fundamentally, when you, when you become, when you enter a family, you learn how to relate or not. And the way you learn to relate basically sets a pattern that you take through your whole life unless you consciously change it. And we know this because in fact some really interesting research is being done with toddlers. So a woman called Mary Ainsworth did research, she called it the strange situation. Um, she was a, a student of John Bowlby who was really the person who got attachment theory understood in the 50s. Mary Ainsworth did her research in the 60s, and the words that I use here today on attachment patterns are the same as she used. Well, almost the same. And what Mary Ainsworth discovered was some children were naturally predisposed to making connections with people, and some of them learned just to do their own thing. Fundamentally, there were two positions children would take. And fundamentally, that's the way it works as adults. Either we are a person who really, really wants lots of connection, and you get, so we call, we call the stuff that stop anxious and secure, because you tend to get anxious if there's not enough connection. The other option is you don't need as much connection, you're quite happy to go off and do your own thing. And you like a partner maybe, but you can be just off and doing your own thing, you have to be task related, task focused, and so on. And that style is called avoidant. Now it's only avoidant. It's not really that it's avoided in the sense they don't want partners. But what happens when conflict occur, occurs, those people tend to be distant. They don't like the heat of the conflict. And some of them have grown up in environments where they've learned not even to trust their own feelings as children. So they've learned not only not to like the feelings of someone else who is heated, but they don't like actually feeling heated themselves. So they even close down for themselves. So avoidance are sort of those two types. But we also know that that's not the whole story. So even though a Margo was based on basically attachment styles, where, what a Margo did is it developed a communication pattern that it was quite rigid, like it was quite prescribed. And I know that I know couples who still use that pattern they were talking and using a Margo. But since then, another, another modality was developed called emotionally focused therapy. Now, emotionally focused therapy did not have such a prescribed communication pattern. But something else did. Another model called the developmental model. Now, the developmental model arose out of work in the 70s and 80s by a number of therapists. Um, and the fa my favourite is a woman called Virginia Satir. So what Virginia Satir did, she was a family therapist in the 70s and 80s. And she realised, she worked mostly with families rather than couples, and she realised that in actual fact, people just couldn't listen to each other. And there were certain dynamics that were going on that caused that problem. Now when most people get into trouble in relationships, that's the problem. They can't listen to each other, and they get worked up with each other, and they simply can't stay calm. Or one gets fired up and the other backs off. The anxious type gets fired up, the avoidance back off. Now, what we know though, is that there are some specific skills and understandings you need in order to do listening well. And to order to be calm with your, your partner. 
You really need to understand how each other is wired, particularly attachment styles, and you need to know how listening works. So what Virginia Satir did is she developed something called I statements. And in the, in the, um, in the therapist world, I statements are famous because they were the first attempts to really get people to calm down and talk about themselves. So I'm feeling upset because that sort of thing. EFT, emotional focus therapy, does not use that structure. And we now know you don't need to use a structure, you've just got to speak for yourself. But the real difficulty is, when you've got different attachment styles, and as I said, all couples have different attachment styles, you see each other through the lens of that style. Now that's a problem, because it means you tend to see the other as you would deem them to be. So for example, let's suppose an avoidant distances themselves from an argument. The person who's anxious, because they would connect in order to get something sorted, they're going to read that as being cold, distant, uncaring, or whatever. They don't read it as he's not coping. And you see the problem. So what happens after time is people get very, very resentful that in fact their partner basically is different. Because they think their partner should be different than they are because the way they are seeing a relationship is completely different. Now that resentment causes a problem. In fact, it completely sabotages relationship. So what happens to resentment, and you'll know about resentment because most people have experienced it one time or another, you can even experience it with your children. But the thing about resentment is, you start to feel resentful because this other person is doing A, B, C, and I would prefer them to be doing X, Y, Z. Why aren't they doing X, Y, Z? Because that's more functional, because that's what I do. Right? So what happens when they get resentful, and then the next step is really interesting. If you have enough resentment, there is a point where you start to see your partner through the lens of resentment. Now that's a, a turning point, because what you, what you do then is you start to see the glass half empty all the time, or most of the time. And you can see what happens is love dies, because it seems like the partner is permanently a problem. The only way you can stop that resentment is to understand your, yourself and your partner, how you got there, and how you can now get out of it by doing something different. Are you with me? I've just over to, to tell you something that's important. I see people writing notes. That's right, it's why you're writing notes. I wanted you to turn to a page in the book where you can write about you and your partner. Okay. And the 
the eye of the example I've given is we the perfect steamroller marries the perfect doormat. So what happens then is people have what we call an interlocking pathology. They, their, their problems work perfectly with each other. So one person is very uh, disempowered, doesn't say anything, and the other person dictates terms. Sometimes people find that fine, but actually most of us won't, and so most relationships are hard work. Relationships number two get into trouble because of unseen dynamics, I've said, that affect all human beings in all relationships. You can't be outside that, that field. Everyone's in the, boat, the same boat. <clears throat> the invisible dynamic is the problem. And it really is one person the problem. Really. It's not exclusively, but really is one person the problem. Problems arise because of the differences that I've just described. All adult programming in each of us has its origins in childhood. And until and unless you address that early conditioning, you are living like a robot. Now, most people are living like robots. <coughs> they don't know they're robots. But in actual fact, every time you get triggered, every time you get the same behavior as before, you're a robot. Sorry? Doing the job. Okay. So, <coughs> the first bit is really important. Whatever we feel inside of us is ours. We can't be made to feel something by another. He makes me angry is the way we were taught not to take responsibility how we feel. And guess where we learned that from? From people who also have been taught. Right? So, if, um, if Jeff turns his, tape, his, his plate upside down when he's three and he's meant to be eating and his mother gets wound up and uses lots of you messages towards Jeff, what happens is he, Jeff learns that's the way you communicate with frustration, that's the way you do things. You don't realise, of course, when you're three, that in actual fact every other three-year-old going through the country is also upsetting their plate, and, not, and therefore don't take it personally because everyone else is doing it. That's not the way it works. Right? You think you are the problem and you take it on to be the problem. Now something very important happens at that point in life. What happens when that occurs is that a groundwork is set, you start feeling shame. And most interactive patterns of arguments with people are based on shame. I'll get back to that later. Number seven. Our challenge there for us to work with how we feel, not taking ownership of how others feel, but being empathic nonetheless. Thank you, Mark. So it's crucial to understand that what's happening in here, inside, dictates what goes on out there. But it's our reactivity, not what's really going on out there that's the problem. So in here is with the source of what we can work with. If out there is a problem, we can use in here to talk about it. But the, the crucial thing to understand is, fundamentally, in here dictates everything. So when you're feeling upset with your partner, they didn't make you feel upset. It was a mysterious thing that went on. If you just, for a moment, went into robotic territory and your old pants were so number eight, it's crucial to understand what's happening, I'm oh, sorry. Number nine, we now must know and own our emotional buttons if we're, to project, if we're not to project more stuff on people, onto other people. Now, I'll go through this quickly, some of you are familiar with it. I've talked about attachment already, attachment is the big one. self so attachment is the background to the marker and it's the background to emotional focus therapy. Self-efficacy is the background to develop the developmental model. So what self-efficacy is about is the fact you can say it's self-empowerment. So we learn to be ourselves, to be self-empowered, self-referenced, self-prioritizing, self-supportive, or other-oriented. Basically, children grow up to learn to prioritize in here or to prioritize out there. And very, very few are very good at prioritizing in here. Virtually everyone starts out more other-oriented than is healthy for them. Being self in the face of others and stepping forward to promote yourself are the two sides of the self and power. So let's, let's have an example, because it would be useful to have an example. So let's suppose Ian says to me, Jeff, I this is Right now, I could then say, if I, if I felt something about that, that would be me. Most people are trained to think Ian's just been a horrible person. 
But the truth is, what Ian's doing is he's being Ian. So what happens then is my response to Ian being Ian tends to be that something goes on in here. Now, if I don't catch the robot at work, what I'm likely to do is speak to Ian out of my history, out of my childhood program, not out of my learned um, wise self. I'll just I'll be reactive. And then he's like to be reactive to my reaction, and off we go. Everyone knows this, this pattern, but not many people see how it plays out. Now, there are two bits to that. So when I'm reactive to what Ian says, I can either go into Jeff, work with the robot, not be the robot, and say something to Ian that is appropriate, and considered, and self-empowered. Or, I can feel that Ian is dominating me. Now, there, so when you, the whole self and power thing has got two sides to it. What do I do with what's out there, and what do I do with what's in here? Can you see that? Very, very important. Because what's going on in here, I've always got, I'm always in charge of. I cannot be in charge of what goes on out there. But if I can stay with what's in here, and then speak from that place, I'm empowering myself. And if someone speaks to me and doesn't knock me around, I'm also empowering myself. They're the two sides to the self-efficacy. Any questions? Is that clear, sort of? With me so far? Okay. So, the key then is inner self-management. The key is really so our inner world gets thrown around when self-efficacy is insufficiently developed. Now, it is then that the wounds of childhood surface as disempowering beliefs and associated emotional reactivity. These must both be managed or we will leak our childhood wounding all over others. A number of years ago, the person who first understood this as a therapist was a guy called Murray Bowen. And he developed what he called the process of differentiating the ego. And when he worked with when he worked with people, he wanted every generation that was alive in the room. He required grandparents, anybody who was alive, to be in the room. And what was he doing? He was tracking the inner reaction of this person to the interaction of the parents and to the interaction interact, inner reaction of the grandparents. He wanted to see how the intergenerational pattern was passed down. Because that's what happens to us. This intergenerational pattern is passed down. So what he wanted to do was to see the whole, the whole thing. You don't really need to see that if you're perceptive enough. And you don't need Freud to lie you on a couch and use um, um, just words, to, to um, association with words to get you to dig that out. All you've got to do is look at how you react. The trouble is, people struggle with that for two reasons. First of all, they're not very aware of what goes on inside, and secondly, they don't want to know anyway. So, in other words, because the problem's out there, not in here. So, the difficulty is getting to come in here and say, okay, what's going on? And it's mostly an emotionally charged thing, which we'll come to in a second. Now, the fourth bit. It's interesting, and this is where Virginia Satir and Jay Haley of the communication school led the way. Murray Bowen later on differentiating the ego to develop the developmental model, which in fact also looks at this. The difficulty is we grow up with people who simply don't have certain skills. When when um, when Rogers first started counselling, he 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 his his thesis was. If you just let the person in effect, eventually they'll heal themselves. They'll go within and they'll give all the answers. But we now know that ain't the case. Um, even though he, this was in the 60s when he started the counselling model, 50s and 60s, we now know that you can listen to a person forever and they will never contact what they need to do for themselves because it isn't in there. They've simply missed out on some childhood programming some childhood modeling and they will never access the part of them that needs to do things differently. This makes sense. 
Now this is important because it means we grew up with relationship skills. So, so we all grew up with some good mobbing and how to relate. Our parents weren't usually disastrous. They had some skills and others were missing. But usually we missed, we missed our books on the mobbing and how to relate skill theory to those close to us. Now this has left us with a relating skills shortage which now must be learned. And the number one thing that's short, that's short in most relationships is how to listen. Now, you'd think that how to listen would be straightforward. <laughs> it sort of is, but the trouble is it gets derailed by number three. If inner management isn't working, people will ramp up and they will shout at each other and do all that or just disappear. So they, they don't do the inner management, so they actually can't be number four. Just making sense. Mm -hmm. So, just to go back, it is crucial you understand your attachment style because once you understand your own pattern and your partner's pattern, you'll realize you are both victims of what you didn't see or know. Now, if you, if you know you're a victim and you can see the other person was caught in their pattern, you can start to let go of resentment. That is the big thing, because resentment is going to just shoot the relationship in the foot and let's start. So any, any questions before I move on? This is a wee bit of time taken to do this intro, but you do more processing of it later on. So, let's go over, over attachment patterns and how they operate. So we're either drawn to connect or get anxious and get anxious if things are not going well, and Mary Ainsworth called that the anxious and secure style. Actually, she called it, yeah, that's all right. Number two, we find ourselves, or we find ourselves wanting to withdraw, especially in the face of conflict or indecision. And that's the avoidance of her. Predominantly women are number one, predominantly men are number two. But there's a variation which mostly women get into. I'm just curious because the thing that keeps coming up for me is the background. Why so that women would be anxiously insecure? And I think there's a lot of learning yes. about that, that we become empathic about that, and we also understand how we can become acculturated and socialised as men and women, because I think that empathy is important in couples. Yes. And we don't, I, I haven't seen research that states why women and men have different styles, predominantly different styles. There is some theories that, in fact, little babies are born with different levels of androgen or, or, or emotionally literate, if you like, hormones. Um, and I'm also aware that um, lots of little boys learn to go off and climb a tree rather than sit on someone's lap to talk things through. Is that a, is that a hormone based pattern? I'm not, I don't know that anyone's really clear about that. I'd love to know. If yeah. It's interesting. Well, it's very important. Uh, the origins aren't so important as the way we are now. The way we are now is what really matters. In my business, we don't consider this a superior style. Because we'll talk, as you'll see, both have their strengths and weaknesses. But number three is something I've never known in a male. Now, so we'll all be functional with a combination of these two patterns. Now, well, and it's called the anxious avoidance insecure style. Actually, um, Bowlby called it, I think, the anxious fearful insecure style. So, what will happen to a connector? I call the, the anxious style connectors, they, they're wired to connect and they do well connecting. What, what happens though is there's a certain point then with conflict where they just give up or they just withdraw. Now sometimes those females have done that in childhood. So by the time they get to be in a partnership, they're already in that pattern. Most though, I think, develop the pattern in a relationship. Now you can see that even if you, are, you consider yourself more number one, there are probably times when you become number three. So number four. If we develop extremes of these options, we can become unbalanced and will struggle to relate or it all very well. I'll give you an example of something I saw this week, a guy, very, very distant, very, what we would call dismissive. So he's so far disconnected that even in my room he will 
struggle to say anything to his partner, even in the safety of my room. And he hardly does any of that outside the room either. So we normally have word, special words for in our normal psychology for the people who are at extremes. But actually, in my experience, they're quite a small percentage of the population. So you don't need to worry that you might be in that category. You probably wouldn't be here if you were a person in those categories, because they'd be too extreme, you just wouldn't want to know. You'd be too dismissive. Hmm? You'd be too dismissive. Too dismissive, that's right. Too Or too wound up at the other end, and you just couldn't cope. Too afraid. Too afraid, yes. What you might discover. Yes. It takes quite a lot to be in a course like this, really. You know, it, takes, it takes risk, and people with extremes wouldn't take such a risk. So the, this guy wasn't even taking risk in my room. There's only me in that whole group. So number five, these patterns are not right or wrong, but each has strengths and weaknesses, and task is to upskill on the weaknesses. So we tend to view the behaviours of others through the lens of our own attachment patterns, as I said before. That is crucial. In other words, we never see our partners as they really are until we learn these attachment styles and also until we learn to ask the other partner what's going on for them, which we don't, have, we don't normally do. We do habitually what most people do is they interpret their partner and they do not ask for clarification. They simply rely on their own interpretation. So, we tend to view our version of reality then as consistently correct or consistently incorrect based on our attachment pattern. So, we tend to want others to do things our way because we perceive our way as better, correct, right, etc., without realizing we're simply preferring our pattern. So, what most people do is they get in into arguments about who's right, they get arguments about viewpoints. And one of the things I have to train couples to do is recognize that both viewpoints are valid. Work on a middle ground, and that requires listening. So number eight, we have a habit of believing the way others are behaving is done to us, rather than they are caught up in their childhood pattern. So we therefore attack the pattern of others, or we defend ours as a way to support our sense of self, our, and our view of what should or shouldn't be. Can you see our problem? Yes? Okay. They come on. Okay, I'll quickly go through this because there are bits in here. Sorry, Chief. I have a question. Yes. Any other one? Um, Previous one? Yeah, you talk about, sorry, in your book, you've also got secure attachment. But you haven't mentioned that here. Is that because you don't think anyone is securely attached? Is everyone one or the other? Okay. Very good question. If you go online and look at the videos online um, about this stuff, they talk about 50 or 60 percent of the population being secure. Well, I haven't met that population yet, and I'm sure it's not in this country, and I don't know where that is. They don't need it. What's that? They don't need therapy. No, they don't. They don't come to see you. <laughs> so I've missed them all because we're all out there doing really well. I'd love to think that was the case. I would say that at the most 10% of the population is secure. And he would be, how would you assess if you were securely attached and, had, and you didn't fit into these insecure patterns? How would you know? Well, that's a situation where you've learned to become more secure from being, say, anxious and secure, right? So you've, you've upskilled yourself. But if a person was naturally secure, what would they be doing that the rest of the population would struggle to do? They wouldn't react. Exactly. It's a simple measure. If you never react to your partner, you're secure. If you react ever, you're not. Simple. 